Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. There's always this weird moment where I'm standing here awkwardly and then the lights come on. I'm like, hey. <laughs> it's fun, though. It's great to see you all. It's great to be here and worship with you on a Sunday. It's a beautiful day to be together as the church, as God's people. If you're new with us or you're watching on Facebook, we are especially glad that you're with us. We want you to come here and bring all of who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your story is, how, how uh, many times you've messed up or blown it. You are welcome in this place uh, because God welcomes all people. So uh, we may be a little bit weird from time to time. So we'll own it. We'll admit that. But we're nice. We'll, we'll do the best that we can to live out what God is, is having us uh, be as the church. So welcome to St. Paul's United Methodist. Uh, I've got a, a Bible with me. It, is, it had, used to have these gold pages on it. They've kind of flaked off. It was fake gold. It really wasn't that valuable. But what was inside was very valuable. And on the cover here, actually, it says, this was, Holy Bible was presented to Britton Fields. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, Smith and United Methodist Church, December 19th, 1993. This was my third grade Bible, too. So we thought, it, Dick, Pastor Dixie and I thought it'd be fun to kind of dust these off and get them out. How cool is that? But this, I got this thing, and um, it just it meant so much to me. I've still got it. So k- kids, they're, they're going to love having these. Um, well, we are, uh, well, f- sorry, before I jump into our sermon series, one quick note. We're still doing listening sessions. I need to make sure I mention that. Uh, I'm doing these listening sessions where I'm actually meeting with people. Uh, I see a few folks who've been a part of some listening sessions here today. Uh, if you have not had a chance to do that, it, it's really great and helpful because you just come and you get to meet me. And then I get to know a little bit about you and, and what you, you know, know about the church, because the church actually is the people who make it up. And so I'll ask you questions like, okay, who is St. Paul's? What's one thing I need to know about it? What is the dream that you have for the church? And I do my best to listen, which is not always easy when you're a preacher, okay? Keep your mouth shut, but I'm going to do my best to listen, and then you'll even have an opportunity to ask me some questions. So I hope you can sign up for that. We're doing them on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, and you can sign up by going to sp.church slash events, or you can just come talk to me or find someone, and we'll help you get, get to them. It's super easy. We want to make sure that they're accessible to you. So don't let the sign up be like a roadblock for you to not uh, come to them. Um, we are in a sermon series on the minor prophets, and we're actually talking about uh, these, these prophets, these books at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, there's 12 prophets, minor prophets, and the, the concern or the uh, I think sometimes the thought when we think of the word prophet is that we just we don't always know what it is. Sometimes we think of it, it's this person like Miss Cleo, like they're trying to tell us the future or something. Some of you know who that is. But this, they're, they're like predicting the future. Well, that's not who, who a prophet is. A prophet is actually someone that speaks a word of truth from God. Sometimes a really hard truth. These were not always people that were the, were the most well-loved or well-liked. Um, prophets also, or the minor prophets, These are individuals who wrote, they just wrote shorter books in the Bible. They're just smaller texts. Uh, So there's these major prophets and minor prophets. Their words are still valid. That doesn't mean they're less significant. They're just just called the minor prophets because they wrote less. All right? And when we hear a word from them, it's important to kind of posture ourselves in the right way. I'm going to kind of say this every week as we are in this series. We need to come into this place with the right attitude, with a softened heart. Because if we walk in with a hardened heart, uh, guess what can happen? It's really, really difficult for God to break through to us. It's really difficult to let God speak to us what we need to hear. And if God does break through, it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. So I say just come in with a soft heart. It's going to make things a lot easier, okay? Uh, when I read these words, too, they, I, I kind of read them. Uh, it, they, they speak to me. They preach to me, right? It, it has to kind of break me up. It has to soften me up. I have to orient myself in the right way. Uh, there's a very, very helpful passage in Jeremiah from Jeremiah 18 uh, about uh, being the potter and the clay, this relationship between God and us. And so I want to read that for you if I can. I'm going to turn to uh, the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 18, and then we will uh, read this, uh, the first uh, six verses of that. And here's what it has to say. It says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord See, a word from God always comes to a prophet. Here's what it says. It said, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. 
And then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O Israel, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. What God was saying as he was holding this, there was this image of a, of a potter holding some clay, and there was these imperfections, impurities. I don't know, I don't work with clay. I'm assuming maybe air bubbles or something. Maybe he didn't shape it right. But, but God noticed it. The potter knows. Sometimes we don't even know ourselves, but the potter knows and uh, began to reshape it, reform it so that it would be right, that it would be right and perfected, not because of what the clay did, but because of what the potter did. The clay just had to submit itself to what God was speaking. And, and so then at the end here, it says that, uh, God was speaking to us, can, can I not do this for you, O house of Israel? Can I not do this for you? Will you be in my hands? Come rest in my hands. That's what God wants for us. So that's the attitude we're going to come with uh, when we hear uh, these, these prophets speaking to us. Last week, we heard from the prophet Hosea, and this was the first book in the Minor Prophets. We talked about how God is a God of grace and how we are never too far gone. And no matter how far we've messed up, God will always call us back home because God is a God of grace. We learned that from Hosea. Well, today we're going to look at a different Minor Prophet. It's the prophet Amos. And Amos would have been living around the same time as Hosea and prophesying around the same time as Hosea, about 750 BCE. And he was from this small town called Tekoa. I've got a map here so we can kind of orient ourselves a little bit, but you can see it kind of in the middle. It's just above that big uh, word Judah. So Tekoa was a small farm town near Jerusalem, uh, but in the kingdom of Judah. So it was kind of outside the cities of Jerusalem. And it was located in the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Now what Amos did during his career is he actually traveled north all the way up to Bethel. You can see, see if you can locate Bethel on that map. Just travel straight up from Jerusalem and you'll find it. Uh, but he, he went from this, he was a farmer from the small town, and he went into a new country, a different country. This was divided Israel. So you got the northern kingdom as Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. That's where we're at. And so he went north into, into Bethel and some surrounding areas, and he was just a regular guy. He had a farm, a farm he was a sheep herder. And I think that's especially significant for us to hear today. See, he wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a preach. He wasn't seminary trained which means that, that God can use any of us to speak something to the world, to speak a truth that the world needs to hear. God can use anyone. And the name of Amos actually means, uh, it means burden. So he kind of was like a, a burden, or, to, or another word for it, a harsher word, was pest. Amos means pest. So when people saw him come and they maybe weren't too happy to see him, he was, it was a perfect name for a prophet, Right? But he, the way I describe it, he, it was kind of like one of these friends, you know, these friends that you have that they correct. Anytime you say a word wrong, they'll, they'll correct that. Or if you use poor grammar, like they're there. They're there to help you out, even though they are uh, so annoying, but they're right, you know? Like, ah, oh, I wish you would get off my back, but, they're, but they're, they're right. So I have to just kind of own up to it and admit it. That's kind of who Amos was. He was this pest. In fact, Amos has this run-in uh, as he's out and about kind of, kind of speaking these truths to the community that he's in, he has a run-in with a priest, this guy named Amaziah. And Amaziah was a priest in the town of Bethel, and he would have known the king of Israel. This was Jeroboam. And so Amos was out causing trouble, stirring things up. He was talking about the injustices that were happening in the society of Israel. And he was saying because Jeroboam, who was the king, was not taking responsibility uh, that Jeroboam was going to die. That's basically what Amos was, was saying. He's going to get his comeuppance, all right? So here's what Amaziah goes. He confronts Amos. Here's what he says. This is uh, Amos 7, verse 12 through 13. It says, And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, make your money there. That's what he's saying. And prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Basically what Amaziah was saying was like, get out of here. We don't want you here. If you don't like it, you can go back to where? Go back to your country. That's the language that was, was happening here in this scripture. The priest was saying that, telling him to go back home. Well, Amos just answers him very plainly and clearly. He says, look, I didn't ask for this. 
I didn't want any of this. Uh, I'm a farmer. I never intended for this to happen, but when God came to me and asked me to speak, you can bet I'm going to go speak. I'm going to speak what God is telling me to say. And so that's what he did. And so Amos was speaking to a, a time and place that, uh, where there was all this economic prosperity, but it was really built on the backs of other people. And so there's, there's words in Amos, Amos chapter 2, you can read about it, talking about how they were selling people, selling needy people for a pair of sandals. They were selling them for just a little bit, insignificant amounts of silver. This is Amos 2, 6 and 7. Uh, to make matters worse, they were actually uh, trampling on the poor. They were exploiting them. They were pushing them aside. And there was also allegations of sexual abuse of, of men towards women in this society. So that's what Amos was preaching about and speaking to. And he was telling uh, them this because these were people who claimed to know God. They were God's chosen people. They loved God. And so, after all, how, how, could, you, how could you believe that if you were allowing this type of stuff to continue in your world. And so then he actually goes and he, he tells them this. It's something that hits a little closer to home and he starts critiquing their worship. Whenever I hear that as a pastor, I'm like, oh no. Uh, he he begins, begins critiquing their worship and, and this may sound a little bit familiar to you because it was uh, used, this, this scripture passage was used by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in his I Have a Dream speech. And it's from Amos 5, verses uh, 21 through 24. So hear this from Amos. It says, God speaking through him. He said, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. And even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your uh, fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. See, what God was looking at and doing here, he was speaking directly to their religious patterns, their rituals, their worship behavior. And, and it was a complete and full rejection of their, their rhythms. And he was looking at these religious festivals, these festivals that would happen from, uh, from time to time throughout the year where there was these big celebrations. Um, and he was saying, uh, he was looking at these religious gatherings. So if they'd come and they'd hear someone preach or teach or, or just read from the scriptures, I was speaking to uh, their, their offerings. If they brought a sacrificial you know, livestock to, to their offerings, God was speaking to that. And, and their music, God was calling it noise. In essence, it was a complete and full rejection of their worship. If they were going to go through these things, God was saying, this, this is all fine, this is all good, but I don't want them. I don't want them if you're not going to look at the people, uh, look at me and look at the people that I love and love them in return. And so uh, what God was requiring of them was these two things. It was righteousness and justice. What righteousness and justice? Otherwise, it's just empty Worship, it's meaningless words, meaningless praise. And look, we, we do a lot of this stuff. We come in uh, to church every single week. We play music, uh, we pray, we, we preach. And I love doing all of this stuff. We, we read scripture. This is all important and it's all good. But, but what God is speaking through Amos is it's all insignificant, meaningless, and pointless. It's noise if we don't love God and the people that God loves. And so these two words, righteousness and justice, these are words that... We don't always use anymore. They're a little bit old-timey. Maybe they feel old-fashioned or almost ancient in, in a way. They also carry with them some baggage. When I say that word righteousness, I don't know how that makes you feel. But for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, gosh, like this is some impossible standard that I have to live up to. How can I live up to this righteous level that God wants me to live up to? Um, and some, for some of us, so when we hear that word, man, do we want to be in a place where, where we might feel like we're being kind of judged all the time. Does that make sense? Have you ever been at a church, a church, or been around someone who is kind of self-righteous? You know that that tends to be what I think of. And then that word justice. When you think of justice in our world, um, that that word has kind of been maybe maybe corrupted a little bit because, of course, we live in a in a time and place where we use the phrase social justice a lot. And so I think some people kind of bristle at that. They're like ah, I'm not sure what that means or. or that I want that, I, I don't know what it is. I, I actually had a, a shirt that said justice on it. 
and it was related to a, a passage of scripture. And I wore this shirt, and I was, uh, had a, a man come up to me and said, hey, you got to be careful wearing that shirt in church. I said, really? Why? Well, because it says justice. I said, well, this is based on a scripture. <laughs> it was interesting. So some of us have these like negative emotions associated with these words, but we shouldn't because God wants this. God wants righteousness and justice for all of us. And so I, I thought it'd be helpful to just define uh, these words a little bit and just define them uh, a, 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 a little bit. And so I've, I've came up with a, a simple definition. It's just righteousness and justice. So first we'll start with righteousness. And very simply for me, it means this. It means that things are right. You can say it with me if you want. Things are right. And in essence, what righteousness means is it means that we are right with God and we are right with one another. Things are right. And justice, again, this is my very, it's, it's an overly simplistic definition, but justice means this. It's to make things right. Say it with me, make things right. And so justice is doing the work. If things are not righteous in our own lives or out in the world, we're going to do the work. We're going to step into the mess. And we're going to try to make it right with God's help. Because we can't do this alone. We cannot be made righteous by our own efforts. No, we need God to do that. We need God's grace. We can't fix all the problems in our community, in our world. No, we need God to help us with that. But we have a role to play. We have a role to play. We partner with God to bring about righteousness and justice in the world. God uses the church. God uses us to bring about those things here on earth. Uh, there's, there's a term, uh, the, the, the word peace. Uh, back in the 1960s, this was a term that people often kind of got messed up or confused. Uh, when you use the word peace back in the 60s, uh, people thought that it was like anti-government, and they also thought that it was like anti-job, like anti-wanting to work. And so this is a term that over time has been corrupted, and, uh, and it can happen to anything. It can happen to anything. Uh, but I think we would all look at that word and say the word peace. We would all want peace for one another, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we want peace for our world and our land? But yet sometimes we can import meaning onto these words, and we, we bristle at them, and we step back. But God wants both. God wants righteousness and justice. There's another concept in the book of, uh, of Amos where they were basically, what was happening is the, the people were looking around them and saying, oh my gosh, look at all the problems in the world. Look at all these things that are happening. There's all sorts of people and they're the ones that are causing the problem. And so this concept in Amos is, and you see it in, throughout the Old Testament, it's the day of the Lord. And so what the people were hoping for is that the day of the Lord would come, that basically meant God would return and God would carry out judgments against the people who were, were not righteous. And so they were hoping for this and, and wanting this. And Amos said, hey, whoa, 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 not so fast. Are you sure you want the day of the Lord? Because if you want the day of the Lord and, and God comes back, you may get something that you weren't wishing for. God may actually come to judge you. And, and he actually tells him, he said, go look around. Go look around at other, other nations. Go look around at your neighbors. See how they're living, how they're behaving, how they're acting. And tell me if you're really that different. You know, sometimes as Christians, I've heard this before, I've probably even used it before, where it's like um, we, we think the issue belongs somewhere else, but it might start right here with us. And I'll say things like, Oh, you know what? Y'all just need Jesus. If Jesus would just return, everything would be fine. And while I do believe that, and we believe as Christians that Jesus is coming back, maybe, just maybe, Jesus wants to do something here and now. And if we believe that Jesus will return, that should kind of put maybe a little bit of, of, of helpful pressure on us, just a little bit of pressure to go out and work in the world to, to, to pursue righteousness and justice. Uh, it's, God wants to see evidence of this in our lives, right? God wants to see evidence of righteousness and justice. It's like when you have that friend coming over for supper and your house is a disaster. And you look and you say, man, I got to get this thing cleaned up. They're coming and they're coming soon. And so you work feverishly to get the house in order. There's a story that it reminds me of. It's the cat in the hat. It's these two kids 
on a rainy day. And here they are, they're, they're, this strange character shows up and they've destroyed their house. But guess what they see when they look out the window? Mom, he's walking up the driveway. What if, what if we looked out our window and we saw Jesus walking up that driveway and we looked around and said, oh my gosh, our house is a mess. I mean, if you look out into the world, we, we have uh, no shortages of problems uh, that we face. Uh, just this past week, I actually lost a friend of mine uh, from COVID. He was 50 years old. And um, when I think about what we're going through as a people, it's going to take all of us working together. Uh, when, when you look out into the world, we have the resources that we have and that we need to solve our problems. We have the res- God has given us everything that we need. God, God has given us the resources. If, if we can just begin to, to set down some of the things that we, we carry with us, right? Set down some of the things that we hold on to, our beliefs, so that we can come to the table and compromise and work together as a people, We should work to clean up our act, right? As if Jesus was coming today. I think where the problem enters enters in, though, is is whenever we focus on one of those two things. I want you to stay with me on this. Just one of the two things, either righteousness or justice. We hyper-focus because we think that's what God wants. So when you think of the word righteousness, it's really kind of this idea of being accountable as an individual. I'm accountable to God. I'm accountable for myself. I'm taking responsibility for my actions, and those are good things to be about. Okay, I want you to hear me when I say that. Those are good things to be about. But, but when we hyper-focus on some of those things to the neglect of our neighbors, to our neighbors who are hurting, to our neighbors who are, are struggling to make ends need, to our neighbors who are caught up in systems, just like in the book of Amos, systems that just make it hard to get going in life again, they might need some help. And so when we focus so much on, on righteousness uh, to the neglect of our neighbors, it can become a problem. And then when we think about uh, justice, now, oftentimes this, this term justice gets associated with like a progressive way of thinking or maybe a more liberal way of thinking, righteousness, more, maybe a more conservative way of thinking. But when we think about justice, it's, it's, it's um, uh, more progressive or more, more liberal. And if we, if we get engaged in these things where we say justice by any means necessary, justice through violence, justice through shame, uh, justice not, by not taking uh, uh, into account our own personal responsibility, it creates a problem. I want to suggest for you maybe a, another way to approach things. And this is, a, this is maybe a third way, a, di- a slightly different way. To quote from the Book of Common Prayer, it says this. It says, peacemaking, it's the updated Book of Common Prayer. Peacemaking doesn't mean passivity. It's the act of interrupting injustice without mirroring injustice the act of disarming evil without destroying the evildoer, the act of finding a third way that is neither fight nor flight, but the careful, arduous pursuit of reconciliation and justice. It's about the revolution of love that is big enough to set both the oppressed and the oppressors free. All of this is to say that it actually reminds me of a scripture a uh, passage and a story from, from the Gospel of Matthew. And we see Jesus, he's interacting with these relig- religious leaders. And of course, every time he interacts with religious leaders, I always think about myself because I work, you know, I'm a pastor. So it's scary to me. But they approach him and they ask him this question. This is Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. It says this, they say, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And here's what Jesus said. He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law, and I love this, get this, and the prophets. I've read that passage, the greatest commandment, countless times in my life. But as I read it through the lens of a prophet, I had never noticed those words. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus was, I think, giving Amos a shout out. 
telling him that when you're speaking about those words, righteousness and justice, that's what I'm about too. That's what God is about. That's what's most important. And to live with righteousness and justice is basically to fulfill the greatest commandment. Just think about it. Loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, that's living righteously, right? Being in right relationship with God. And then taking care of our neighbor, loving our neighbor, that's living with justice. And God wants us to do both of those things. They ask him what's the most important commandment. Jesus doesn't separate him. He puts them together just like Amos does. We should care about uh, who we are as individuals. We should care about uh, how we are acting and living as a community. And it's going to be hard and messy and frustrating. We're going to have to work with difficult people along the way, absolutely. But we're going to do it because it's what God wants from us. I want to share with you just a formula uh, that, that might be helpful to you because I'm an engineer. It's just this. It's righteousness plus justice equals love. That's the love that God was talking about or that Jesus was talking about here in the scripture. If we pursue righteousness and justice, that's how we love our God and neighbor. And so we don't want to step out of the game or take ourselves out. We want to get into the game and uh, step into our responsibility as Christians and as the church. We're going to be all about that because we want to bring hope and healing and restoration to our community because it's the right thing to do. What does God want from us? It's righteousness and justice. Look, these can sometimes be really hard and difficult conversations because it puts us at odds with one another. It can create some tension in the room but, and it can maybe feel a little bit scary, but we can't do it all on our own. That's the other thing. It can just feel totally overwhelming, but we need uh, to just focus on what, the things that we can do to live with righteousness and justice. I want to suggest one thing for you. It's, it's begin with prayer. And to pray a prayer that Amos prayed or spoke uh, from From 5.24, Amos 5.24, he said this, but let justice rule down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Maybe make that part of your daily routine or your weekly rhythm, whatever it is, but pray that prayer and say, God, will justice and righteousness flow through me and may justice and righteousness flow through my church. Make that part of your routine. The other thing is educate yourself. Begin to meet Uh, people who you don't maybe always agree with, people who think differently than you, and rather than trying to convince them of of what you believe, just listen and learn and set down the anger and just take them in because they are truly human. The last thing we can do is just get involved. Serve in some way, because when you work alongside someone, I've never been upset or angry when I'm working alongside someone, as long as they're they're helping me, right? (laughs) But to, to work with someone, you, you, get to, you just get to learn about them and, and grow with them and then help people in the community. We have all kinds of stuff happening in our church. You go to uh, sp.church slash events. There's some stuff happening uh, on August 14th that weekend you can get signed up for. And we do all of these things, all of these things so that we can begin to see people in a new way. That's really what it's all about. We want to see people in a new way through this lens of righteousness and justice, see them as human for who they are, there was a man, his name was Tom, and he would frequent the church that I was at in Kansas City. He'd come by, and it was pretty obvious that he had no place to stay. He was homeless. And so he'd come by, and his clothes were dirty and gross, and uh, he, he really did not smell very good, if I'm being honest. And occasionally, I would take him out and take him around the town. If he needed something to eat, like I'd take him to a place and get him some food, or I'd take him to the pharmacy and get him some medicine that he needed. Uh, he didn't eat very well. He would always go to like these fast food restaurants, he could walk to places. He was very adept at navigating the city. He had a bus pass, and so he could, he could get around, or like I said, sometimes I would take him. And so when we'd go to the pharmacy, I would get him antacids because his like, indigestion was so bad. He just didn't eat well, you know. Um, and so I offered him all the help that I could, and at one point I found myself just getting, I was so upset. I was so upset with, with him because I didn't feel like he ever wanted to change. But the more I thought about Tom and, and who he was, like he had kind of built his way of life. He was 60 years old. I didn't need to necessarily change him or look at him as someone that needed to be fixed. I just needed to offer him what little help I could. Would you pray with me? God of righteousness and justice, God of love. We are so thankful to be called your people. 
We're thankful that you have these prophets that speak to us, that challenge us to live after you and seek after you in new ways. God, may we be a righteous people. God, help us deal with the things in our own lives. Uh, if, it's, if there's something that we know that we brought in with us today, God, that, that is not right, that needs to be changed, God, we just open ourselves up to you. Shape us, shape us. And God, if there is something that we are feeling or struggling with, I pray that we can just have a moment of vulnerability, that we can be raw with you, open and truthful and honest and share it. And God, if it would be helpful for a community, our church, to hear that and help someone in their walk and their faith, we want to be about that. And God, let our church, St. Paul's United Methodist Church, be a beacon of light and hope to the community that sees everyone as truly human and does the work of justice in our world. We love you, God. We praise you forever and always. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen.